In this short video, we'll look at how to solve radioactive decay calculation questions. We won't be focused on equations, but instead we'll look at an intuitive approach to solving these problems. The key to this approach is finding the number of half-lives. Why does this matter? The number of half-lives will tell us how many arrows we need to draw. So for example, if something underwent two half-lives, then we would draw two arrows. These represent the halving points on this particular problem. So for example, if we started with 100 grams of a sample and that 100 gram sample underwent two half-lives, then at each of the arrows, we would go ahead and cut this number in two. So after one half-life, we'd have 50 grams. And after the second half-life, we'd only have 25 grams remaining. We can use this approach in a variety of different situations to tackle different types of radioactive decay questions. But let's go ahead and start by looking at some really straightforward ones to see how we'll apply this on an actual MCAT style question. Our first question asks, a 36 gram sample of an unknown substance has a half-life of 20 minutes. How much of the sample will remain after 60 minutes? So our first goal is to get to that key, the number of half-lives, but how do we do that? Well, it's pretty straightforward. If they give us half-life or how long it takes for something to have in size, then we'll just take this number and the total amount of time, and we're gonna divide the total amount of time by the length of time it takes for a single half-life. This is going to tell us how many half-lives we have overall. So 60 over 20 will be equal to 3. From here, we're going to go ahead and draw three arrows to represent the half-lives that we have. So there's our first half-life, our second half-life, and lastly, our third half-life. Now, we started here with the 36-gram sample, and they want to know how much will remain after the 60 minutes, or basically what's over here. At this step, now we'll begin by having it at each of the arrows. So to begin with, 36 divided by 2 is 18. So that's what it would be after one half-life. From there, we would have 18, and that would be 9. And then finally, half of 9 would be 4.5 grams. So in this particular case, after 60 minutes or three half-lives, this 36 gram sample will now only be 4.5 grams. In the previous question, we were asked how much is remaining, but questions can also ask about how much is decayed. Let's go ahead and look at how this works and a couple more examples so we can continue to see how we can use the half-lives to figure out radioactive decay style calculations. First, let's discuss the difference between decayed versus remaining. Anything that's remaining is gonna show up as this really bright green and decayed is gonna show up as this darker green right here. As we go down a half-life, we're going to get rid of half of our sample or half of it's going to decay. So it makes sense that in our first instance here, we would have half of our sample remaining and we would have half of it that has decayed. Now that we only have half of our sample remaining, when we go down to our next half-life, we're only going to decay half of what we have remaining. So it would look something like this. And now we can see that as we're going along, the amount that is remaining is shrinking, but the amount that is decayed is increasing. This is really important to understand because if we chart out these two as we go along, this is what we'll see. In the first one here, we have 100% of this remaining. And then as we continue, now we only have 50% remaining. Then finally, we have 25% remaining. Well, how much has decayed? Well, initially in this first instance here, 0% of the sample has decayed. In the second, 50% has decayed. And then at the end, 75% has decayed. If we ever want to know how much has decayed, we'll simply take the amount that we've gotten, so say this 25%, and we'll subtract it from our starting amount, which was 100%. So since 100 minus 25 will be 75%, that will always tell us how much has decayed. And we can do this regardless of whether it's this really clean breakdown of 100, 50, and 25, or if we started some particular sample with, say, 36 grams, and then it broke down further. Let's go ahead and look at some questions where we can apply this and see how this will work. Now that we've seen the difference between remaining versus decay, let's apply this concept to a particular problem that's going to ask us about both. This says a 300 gram sample of cesium-137 has a half-life of 9 minutes. How much will remain after 36 minutes? So again, we're trying to get to our number of half-lives so we can figure out how many arrows we need. In this case, we always take our total time, which is 36 minutes, and we'll put it over how long it takes for a single half-life, which is 9 minutes. 36 divided by 9 is equal to 4, so we need to draw 4 arrows, one for each of our half-lives. In this case here, we start with a 300 gram sample. So we can go ahead and put this at the very beginning and we'll just begin having it at the at end of each arrow. So 300 would then be halved and end up as 150 and 150 would then become 75. And half of 75 would be equal to 37.5 and half of 37.5 would then be equal to 18.75 grams.
So in this particular case, if we're wondering how much will remain after 36 minutes, that's actually what we solved for. So the answer to this question would be 18.75 grams. Well, let's say we want to know how much has decayed. Well, if we started with 300 gram sample and we only end with 18.75 grams, then the difference between what we started with minus what we end with has to account for the amount that is decayed. So in this particular case, we can always solve for decayed by simply taking what we start with and subtracting from it what we end with. So in this particular case, we would end up with 281.25 grams that decayed over the process of these four half-lives. It's really important that you note the difference in terms of the question, whether it's asking about remaining or decayed, because as we can see here, we get drastically different correct answers for each. And the AMC might include both the amount that was remaining as well as the amount that decayed. And we don't want to get tripped up by that. Now that we've seen the difference between decayed and remaining questions, let's also look at fractions and percent-based questions for radioactive decay. So this question here asks, a sample of radon has a half-life of four days. What percent of a radon sample is left after 12 days? So first things first, we're always going to be thinking, are we dealing with decayed or remaining? Here they're talking about is left after 12 days. In this particular case, this is a remaining question. And this is really important since we want to make sure we're solving for the right thing. Now that we've understood this, we want to go ahead and get to the number of arrows and the number of half-lives. Here it says a sample of radon has a half-life of four days, and it was decaying for a total of 12 days. So we take our total time of 12, and we divide it by the number of, of days that it takes for a single half-life, which is four days. In this case here, this is equal to three, or we're going to have three total half-lives overall. We'll go ahead and draw out our three arrows, and this is where things are going to be different. We haven't been given an overall am starting amount, but instead we're asked about the percent of a particular sample. So we always start with 100%, and again, we'll just be having this as we go. So after the first half-life from 100%, it's going to be only 50% remaining. And once we have 50%, then it's only going to be 25% remaining. And after 25% in the next half-life, we'll only have 12.5% of the original sample that's remaining. So if they ask for percent, you'll just always start with 100% and have just like you would if it was a normal sample. Now let's look at this next question, which asks what fraction of radon has decayed? So this is really important to note that this is a decayed question because we're going to be solving this a little bit differently than we did for the remaining question. Here it asks about fraction, though. So again, we don't need to resolve for anything here because we already know that we have three half-lives. We just need to redraw our arrows. And in this case, if they ask about fraction, we're going to go ahead and start with one, and we'll just have one, keeping it as a fraction as we go. So at the first half-life, it's one half. And if we half a half, that's one fourth. And if we half a fourth, then we get one eighth. Basically, what you're going to do in this particular case here is you're going to take the bottom number and always just multiply the denominator by two. So it was one over one, and then we took one times two, and that's how we got two. And then we took two, and we multiplied it by two, and we got four, and we took four, and we multiplied it by two, and that's how we got eight. Now, they asked about the amount of radon that was decayed, and this would represent the amount that's remaining. So to figure out the amount that has decayed, we'll just go ahead and take one eighth, and we'll subtract it from one. We can think of one as the same thing as saying eight over eight. So really, we're going to do eight over eight minus one eighth, which will be equal to seven over eight. So the amount of radon that has decayed or the fraction of radon that has decayed in this particular instance will be seven eighths of a sample. So far, outside of changing whether looking for decayed or remaining, asking for a sample size or percent or fraction, we haven't really changed the exact setup of the problems. We're always going from some starting amount, finding the number of half-lives, and finding the ending amount or how much has decayed in that particular process. But these questions can be asked in a couple of different ways. Let's go ahead and look through some alternative setups, keeping in mind that our key is still to get to the number of half-lives so we can draw those arrows. Here's our first example. This question asks, a 10 gram radioactive substance with a half-life of three minutes would take how long to decay into a sample containing 2.5 grams of the original substance? So here we're not asked for the ending amount, but instead how long it took to get from start to finish. Now we want to think about how many arrows does it take to go from 10 grams to 2.5 grams. And the easiest way to do this is to just go ahead and start with 10 grams and draw arrows and have sequentially until you get to your target amount or 2.5 grams. Now we'll just go ahead and count the number of arrows we have. So we have one, two, we have two half-lives overall, and they told us how long each half-life was. So if we have two half-lives and each is three minutes, then overall, it should take six minutes for this 10 gram sample to decay to 2.5 grams. Here, it's a slightly different setup, but we can see that that key is still getting to those arrows or those number of half-lives. Let's look at another example now. This next question introduces the idea of pulling radioactive decay information from graphs. So let's go ahead and see how this works and dive right in. 
This says the graph below shows the decay of FL 289. If a sample of the FL was left out for four seconds on the counter and found to contain one gram of FL, how much FL was present prior to decay? So in this particular case, we're being asked for how much did we start with? And we're given a finishing amount of one gram. We're also given an amount of time, but this doesn't directly correlate to how many errors we should have in between. We need a half-life amount for this to work. Well, we can go ahead and pull that from this graph. And typically what you're going to see is you're going to see some measure on the y-axis that will correspond to amount. Now, in this case here, it directly corresponds to grams, but this could be something like millicuries or activity, just something that's going to measure the amount of radioactive stuff that we have there. And on the other axis, you're generally going to see something like time. In order to find the half-life from these graphs, all you want to do is find a nice point that you can have. So for example, for me, that would be 10 grams, because then we can just go ahead and see how long did it take on this graph to go from 10 grams down to 5 grams. So this is our starting spot here. And if we read this over, then it looks like it took about 2 seconds to go from the very beginning, where we had 10 grams, to the 5 gram mark, where we had 2 seconds. So this is really important because we know that we have a half-life of two seconds. And just like before, we'll simply take the total amount of time, which is four seconds, divide it by our half-life or what it takes for a single half-life, two seconds. And this is going to go ahead and tell us how many overall half-lives we have. So in this case, four over two would simply be two. So we need to draw two arrows. But in this case, we're going to draw the arrows pointing towards the one gram, and we're going to work backwards. So normally, if we were given some number that would fill in this x here, we would be dividing by 2 each time we went on one of these arrows. If we want to reverse this process and go backwards, then we're going to go ahead and multiply 2 as we work backwards. So we'll go 1 gram, and then 1 gram times 2 would be 2 grams. So after that first half-life, we had 2 grams that has is remaining. Well, what about our original sample? We'll just go ahead and repeat this process again. And therefore, this means that this x has to be equal to 4 grams. And this works out because if we had 4 grams, we had one half-life, we divide by 2, we get 2 grams, and then we do that again, we get 1 gram overall. So in this case, 4 grams was present prior to decaying if this sample was left out for a total amount of 4 seconds. All right, let's go ahead and look at this last question. And this one says, a sample of copper and nicium 295 has an initial activity of 400 millicuries. What is the half-life of copper and nicium if it takes 2.5 minutes for the sample's activity to reduce to 12.5 millicuries? In this particular instance, we're being asked to work backwards. So we want to know where or how long is, it, is a single half-life? Well, to do this, we need to figure out how many half-lives do we have in the 2.5 minutes that this was occurring. And again, we're going to see a pattern here. We've been given an initial activity of 400 millicuries, and we've been given a ending spot. Just like in that first question that we approached when we we're looking at alternative setups, we're going to go ahead and put our 400 at the beginning, and we're going to put 12.5 at the end. And now we need to try and draw arrows between these two to figure out how many arrows are we going to get till we land on 12.5. So first, we're going to have 400, and this will go to 200. And then from there, 200 will go to 100. And then 100 will go to 50. And then 50 will go to 25. And then lastly, 25 will go to 12.5. We'll just go ahead and now count our arrows. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So in the total of 2.5 minutes, we had a total of 5 half-lives occurring. In this particular case here, all we'll need to do is simply solve this out, and this will tell us how long did it take for a single half-life to occur. Well, this would be 0 0.5 minutes is equal to one half-life, or if we wanted to put this in seconds, this would be 30 seconds per half-life. So we're doing a lot of the same things, but it's just slight variations on these problems, and ultimately that key is still to find the number of arrows since it's really going to unlock these problems. If you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe for more MCAT content and share it with anybody else who might be taking the exam.